going on, guys? So, very, very excited to share this interview with you guys. It's been a while since I've talked to you, had a couple technical issues, and thank God I work for an IT company. Um, so, but now everything's back on track. Um, happy to share this interview with you guys with some friends of mine, Kai and Gersh, uh, founders of Virtuoso Energy, a local solar energy company. Um, these guys are doing some incredible things. Went to their event at uh, Tesla last night. Uh, a ton of fun. Thank you for having me, by the way. And I think a ton of you guys will get a bunch of value from these guys' journey and their story and some of the insights that they shared during this interview. Um, so check it out. Let me know what you guys think. And last thing before going and just going into this interview. Um, just launched our new website, suresystems.ca. Uh, I'll link to it down below. Let me know what your guys' thoughts are because whether it's this interview or that website, and as and I always say this, as much as I work for Sure Systems, if I'm doing my job right, I'm ultimately working for you guys. So your feedback means everything to me. Let me know what you guys think, and I'll see you guys on the other side. What's going on, guys? <laughs> There's too much going on. I don't know where to look. I don't know what to do with my hands. But thank you for coming. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, no worries. And anything that I can do to kind of give back to the business community here in Calgary, because I wouldn't be where I am today without, you know, all the support that I had early on. So this is just my opportunity to give back. Perfect. So for, you know, the people that don't know who you guys are, why don't you give us a little introduction? So yeah, I'm Gersh with Virtuoso Energy, and I'm the Director of Business Development. Uh, I'm Kai with Virtuoso Energy, and I'm Director of Operations. Sweet. So, how did you guys get into this? Uh, how did you guys get your jobs? I guess you can almost say we created them. It's, it's probably a good point to start. It, we ideally saw an opportunity that existed, but were in an existing framework that didn't allow us to do what we wanted to. And what I mean by that is, as young people, uh, when we were growing up as children, we had major influences in our life that were focused around sustainability. Uh, my mom uh, was an animal rights advocate as a child, so I grew up as a vegetarian. And the older I got, the more these values sunk in when I started to learn who I was. And the industry that I was working in at the time, which was oil and gas, didn't necessarily provide that option at the time. Mm -hmm. And so I linked up with Kai, and Kai's story somewhat lines up right with that as well, too. Yeah, so pretty much the same kind of realm of things. Grew up um, in a sustainable form, so to say, um, for that time. My grandpa was involved in engineering solar farms in Europe. Um, my parents have always been kind of first adapters to solar, electric vehicle, things like that. And then also on the food side. So I grew up with my half of my family being vegetarian and my dad eating meat. And I kind of had the choice. And at the start, I was more on the side of eating meat with vegetarians, so limiting my meat intake. And then it kind of went into the realm of linking up with Gersh and the industry that we're in that I've actually now pretty much cut out all of meat unless it's a very, like, unless it's a rare occasion mm -hmm. and then again just the influences from outside and different perspectives that we both have so and that's kind of how we got into this role like you said we created it ourselves so to say but out of uh we saw a need in the economy in alberta to diversify as well so so what was that need the need was focused around just managing the resources that we have so we identified a few different factors in the canadian lifestyle that might depending on the lens that you're looking at it from a global perspective, would be considered deficiencies. So let's take a look at our energy as a whole. Um, the majority of the energy that's provided in Alberta is from an emission source, so whether it be natural gas or oil in some capacity. Uh, mind you, the industry that we do have is excellent. If you take a look at global standards for safety, production quality, the actual different processes that we have to follow in order for a product to get through the, pi through the pipeline, it's fantastic in Canada. That's not the issue. The issue was tied around the fact that there wasn't a big diversity piece. So um, there wasn't a, a very strong renewables portfolio. People didn't necessarily have access to it at home or at work. Uh, the main form of transportation is gasoline fueled vehicles. There wasn't too much battery support for electric vehicle charging infrastructure. And the deeper that Kai and I got into it, the more that we realized that this there was no lifestyle to be lived here other than the one that was mandated from the larger corporations. So we started looking at things as a whole, started addressing concerns that people might have, and created a model around a, a sustainable lifestyle. And that was, oddly enough, heavily tied around reduce, reuse, recycle. So, so I, don't think, I don't think I asked this, but what is, it, what is Virtuoso? So, Ty, you can tackle this one, sure. 
<laughs> so, <laughs> so like the whole the realm of what the company profile yeah. is, or yeah. So, like Gersh mentioned, it was built um, at the start. It wasn't built around this, but it kind of evolved over time and learning more of what we're good at and what we kind of want to see in the industry as well. So it was built around reduce, reuse, recycle. So the first portion is efficiency. So in our company, it stands for uh, LED stands for living efficient daily, which is reducing your footprint um, at a commercial level, industrial level. So lighting controls, HVAC, things like that. Then the next portion is solar. So producing your power locally, um, offsetting your loads after you've reduced your loads. So bringing that section of it into it. And then the last part is electric vehicles. So building electric vehicle infrastructure. So bringing that opportunity to Alberta where there's always the question, the chicken or the egg, right? So mm -hmm. does the car come first or the charging? So we're not at the point where we can produce our own vehicles. So we kind of said, why don't we integrate EV charging into that and bring that to the Alberta market and kind of, we are certified through Tesla and the distributor of ChargePoint and pretty much work hand, hand in hand with them to develop the market here. So te like they are, Tesla doesn't manufacture cars here, do they? No, they don't do any because I know there's one like just over. There's some Tesla shop just over here, right? So those yeah, are right road. sales centers. Uh, Chinook, oh. there's a sales center. So they do their business model completely different. As probably a lot of people know, they don't really have like a showroom. It's more sales centers, right? Mm -hmm. And then you buy online. Uh, and then the actual other facility is a maintenance. So they do like service and you can go in and take test drives and things like that. So that's where their side of it is. But we do their electric vehicle charging stuff. So on the residential level, we'll do even power walls and stuff like that on the energy side, but yeah. that's where that kind of ties into the EV, so. Okay, so yeah. kind of like, so you guys, like, how did you guys kind of like meet? How did all of this come together? Because you guys have similar stories. Yeah, it was pretty interesting. So both Kai and I are electricians. Yeah. We were working in the field, and at the time it was a sulfur facility, so. A sulfur facility? Yeah, a sulfur okay. facility just east of the city, and you know, you, you'd go there, You'd work there for the entire day, and your whole, all of your clothing and everything that was on you would be consumed by sulfur. You'd sit in your vehicle, you'd drive home. That would smell like sulfur. You pretty much had to throw your car away at the end of the job. It was one of those situations. Gross. And Kai, um, Kai was actually my leader in the field, and I was working underneath him at that time. And one of our supervisors on site teamed us up. He's like, "Hey, I want you to work with him." We met, and oddly enough, I've always, I've always been very big on sharing and getting to know somebody. We're doing somewhat repetitive tasks, so there was an opportunity to kind of discuss things and get to know one another. Oddly, and the other big thing as well is we both had the same car. Pulled up, had the same car. Uh, I had vegan energy balls that my wife had made, so she makes homemade vegan energy balls. And I was like, hey, do you wanna, do you wanna try one? I'll give it a go, and he, he liked it. And the weird thing about it was it opened up the conversation for him to discuss that, hey, my mom was like this. I'm like, oh, so it was my mom. We started under understanding each, of each other's value sets and realized that that was the thing that was most formidable about our relationship right out of the gate, was we had a very similar perspective and lens on life as a whole. We wanted to achieve the same things, which at that time was own our own business. And we both had big audacious dreams, which was triggered by a movie that we watched. And we ended up shaking on it right after that movie. Um, oddly enough, we watched it at Chinook there. It was Interstellar. Interstellar. Interstellar was kind of the catalyst that was the piece that pushed us over that line that said, um, you know what, like, here's a movie about humanity breaking boundaries and pushing further than they ever have and trying to achieve something in order for the survival of the species. And Kai and I looked at him and were like, yeah, you know what, if Matthew McConaughey can do it, we can do it. So, <laughs> <laughs> and actually, yeah. the ironic part about that was a lot of that movie's filmed in Alberta. So no way. Southern Windy Alberta, Flats. Yeah, Windy yeah. Flats. So that well, kind of tied it all that. back yeah. to bringing it home. So when Gersh mentioned let's go watch this movie. He'd already watched it. And he was mm -hmm. like, you gotta come watch this movie. We walked, I've never walked out of a movie for 10 minutes and nobody talked. Like literally, we went with us and two other buddies, none of us talked and then we went and sat down and just said, it's time to make that leap. Like we need to do this and it's, it's in our hands kind of thing. So that was, that was actually the night that we shook on it. We didn't incorporate that night, but yeah. we, that's the night we shook on it and said, we need to, we need to do this and then uh, quit our jobs kind of thing down the, down the So road. what was that like, quitting? Like, I know this is going way off topic, but like... <laughs> no, <laughs> no, your no. Job? You're going to laugh. You're going to laugh yeah. at this. We were... This is, this is terrible, but like, <laughs> the first thing I should put out there is the people that we were working with, and it was Stratus Electrical Instrumentation. They're doing fantastic right now, by the way. Uh, they really well-ran company, and a testament to the leaders in that company as well, too, because even after we quit, they supported us. They helped us out. They're like, hey, you're two young electricians. We're well-versed in all of this. Um, it is hard to start your own business, but we'll support you however we can. 
But the interesting thing, the lead up to that point was kind of funny. So Kai and I were just kicking, around, kicking it around one day. Said, we should team quit, just jokingly. And this was like a year before this point when we actually quit. And the time came and Kai and I were just sitting and talking. And I think we came to the point where like, hey, we should talk to, talk to our boss. And I think we should team quit. So <laughs> we, we took him out for lunch and we team quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're like, hey, so yeah, sorry to say, like, I know... You've been, I think he saw yeah, it coming. I think like he, he saw it coming. Yeah, yeah okay. it wasn't like a. Scene. No, it wasn't like a left hook. On. It was. It was like. No, we were okay, very forward good. with them. We we're yeah. like, know that we were working, moonlighting in a sense, but yeah. they knew that we had the energy the industry, and yeah. we were grinders, so we weren't giving them anything less than 100 percent during yeah. their hours. So they and were after that. Then yeah, and yeah. then the opportunity opened, and oddly enough, Sate was also part of the story as well too. When I was in fourth year school and Kai had already graduated, he got invited to an alumni competition. It was called Build Your Business. Uh, and we had, a, we had a chance to listen to the owner of Rouge, Paul, uh, Rouge Restaurant. I'm not sure if you've been there. Excellent restaurant in Inglewood. Uh, and he gave, house, right? yeah, 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 he grows everything One in the backyard. The backyard yeah. It's a fully sustainable, uh, I think, not fully sustainable, perhaps it is, but it, he grows everything in the backyard. That's and, so sick. Yeah, and he, an incredible guy too, a lot of vision. And he shared his story and it, it, it kind of shook us. We were like, okay, well, hey. Here's a Calgary guy. You went to the school. He started a successful business. Like, let's let's do this. Um, Kai was. I'm a little bit more risk adverse, so Kai kind of pulled the trigger and he's like, let's get this done. And during that competition, it was it was really crazy timing. Kai was in Saskatchewan, sleeping, doing oil and gas projects, but sleeping on a bed, not in the bed, in his clothing, because it was. Yeah. Like, like you know those ones in the movies where it's like there's cockroaches and you. you the bed sheets are so dirty, like you leave your clothes on. It was yeah. like it was like ten. You wear your hoodie over your head. Yeah. It's like ten dollars a night, and it was part of the the whole like journey of that project. Yeah. But yeah, it was it was a good time. It was perfect timing for this business competition to come up and yeah. put our foot into it. So. So the day leading up to it, he was he was in Saskatchewan, had to drive all the way back. The competition was the next day. I had just written my interprovincial, and then I was writing the national exam the next yeah. day. Uh, on this on the eve of that um, the exam was the competition so we're both exhausted I can't think straight we're trying to look at the slides and get everything together and at that point I think it was 2015 or 2016 the entire our entire business model was designed around sustainability so even at that point we were thinking about it we did a low medium and high case analysis of solar and we broke all the projections a 10-year projection we broke in six months whoa yeah like like sales production? Yeah, projection? sales projection. Yeah. Holy. And yeah. they were pretty, like... They are pretty aggressive. It's not like we were saying, like, oh, we want to make two jobs. I think they are pretty aggressive. Uh, even the, the high case, it was, it was done with accounting and everything and taken into account. So yeah, we SWOT pretty, analysis, uh, everything was completed. Yeah. Like, we did a proper analysis of it. And, and that was the big thing, is we presented that as al electrician alumni. And uh, this is just like a testament to say it as a whole and the different programs they offered at that time. It equipped us to do this correctly and they ran us through that program. And uh, yeah, we ended up washing, washing the rest of the competition away. And oddly enough, it was just five grand, but five grand was enough for Kai and I to say, let's quit our jobs. And that was all the money that we had that we started the company with at that time. So it was pretty much 5,000 bucks to get the company off the ground. And now this is almost four years later. Four years later now. Yeah. How many how many people do you guys have working with you guys? Uh, it's about nine to ten. Nine to ten? Yeah. That's awesome. And then yeah. plus contractors. Plus contractors. Yeah. So. Plus contractors yeah. and whatnot, yeah. Yeah. So that's so like so what's you know, kind of going on the topic of energy. Um, what do you think that we as Albertans have to do to kind of diversify ourselves? Oddly enough, I think as crazy as this sounds, uh, what we're doing right now necessarily isn't the worst thing that ever. And, and going through um, almost the deconstruction of an industry mm -hmm. and finding all the deficiencies in it and then building it back up might be the best way to do it. There's a lot of other examples across the world where there's been massive government incentives that have come into play or private industry in a large scale coming in and kind of sweeping the floor and getting things done. In Alberta, it's a homegrown methodology. It'll be a bunch of small companies that come together or com companies just alone and try to build it from a grassroots perspective. And I think that's the first thing that we're doing that's correct. As far as diversifying the portfolio, I think as a whole, um, one of the dangerous things that happens as an Albertan <coughs> is it's quite easy to get caught up in your own life. You know, it's not, 
it's not necessarily the easiest thing going day by day. Everybody has their own issues, whether it be social or financial or whatever it might be. It's not the easiest times out there. And get, allowing yourself to separate from that momentary pain and looking five years down the road, 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, and doing some minor changes to set yourselves up so that your future is protected rather than being consumed in the now is the single biggest thing that I think Albertans can do, which is very easy to say, but completely hard to do. And that'll be, the, that'll be the major catalyst because sustainability as a whole isn't a today thing. If you, let's say for an example, were to cut out every single piece of dairy and every single meat item in your life, how long would it take you? I wouldn't expect you to do it overnight. Nope. Yeah, it would take a long time. Even yeah. if, if the first thing is, do you even want to do it? The second thing is, how long would it take you? And then from there is, can you stick to it? This is the same methodology, is we're used to an existing energy source that has been around our entire lifespans. Mm -hmm. It's been around most of our parents' lifespan, but that's it. The generation before that didn't have oil and gas, if you really think about it. It's something that's new. It's been around for a while, but not for long. Interesting, really. interesting. Yeah, I guess like for it to like, it's been around for a while, but for it to, you know, start taking up buildings and towers and things like that, employing, you know, a good chunk of our population, that's relatively. But yeah, and how good. quickly was downtown Calgary built? Dubai's gone up in like five years, right? These things happen quickly when there's money there. And that's what happened with Calgary too, is money came in and that was one of the beautiful things about oil and gas. It's brought so much innovation, a lot of talented individuals, engineers, accountants, whatever you want to talk about. But now they, ha they need somewhere to go. And that's one big thing that we've had the opportunity at Virtual. So Kai and I are the dumbest people in the company, hands down. <laughs> <coughs> Hands down. Far. Okay, go, you're, yeah. you're gonna have to explain that. Yeah, one. you can touch on this. <laughs> so, yeah. so pretty much what he's saying with that is, we've been able <clears throat> to surround ourselves with very talented people um, in spaces that have educations. We have people on staff that have gone to Queens. We have people with university business degrees, um, all realms of things, right? CAs, stuff like that. So, we're not gonna be the smartest ones in that in that room ever. But it kind of comes back to that tying that vision to what we want to do so other people are involved as well. And that's where a lot of people are starting to see they weren't happy in different places and they're, they're looking, how do we diversify and how do we get into a space that's different and new and exciting? And that's where we've had, I guess, so to say, luck um, with the people that have come on board with us and that have, they grind as hard as we do, right? So that we were talking about that earlier is we're not the ones work, we're not always working the hardest. We have guys and girls on our team that on Sundays will email us and be like, hey, I just did this proposal. Like they're grinding as hard as we are. And the thing about that is because they're bought into the vision, right? And they see the bigger picture. And it goes back to the question that you had with um, long-term vision. They don't look at it as this is a six month job, this is a one year job. They look at it as this is an industry that's up and coming and we're looking at like five, 10, 15 years down the road, right? They're looking at yeah. how do we grow our careers? How do we grow ourselves? in a space that we're excited about and that we believe in. And our generation is really well known for that, right? Is yep. we need to put something behind it to believe in or else we won't do it or we get burnt out, so to say, right? And that's the, the hot new uh, term as well is people are burning out. It's because you're not excited about what you're doing, right? So mm -hmm. if, if you can get that excitement all the time, you shouldn't have to burn out in that realm either, right? So yeah. it's it's a big space. I know it's a bit off topic on some no, of it, but it, that's cool. it kind of, yeah, it's it, it ties back to the question of, um, what Alberta kind of needs to see is instead of being these cycles of seven year recessions, it's that doesn't have to happen. That just people just think that's how it happens. If we look at other economies as well, it's not always the case, right? You can diversify enough that there's recessions in certain areas, but other other areas pick it back up, right? So like this part falls, this part then succeeds a bit more and it comes back to tech. Like we have huge tech innovation in Calgary, yeah. Edmonton, Gersh always uh, mentions this with AI. Like you said, the third biggest yeah. development of AI is in Are Edmonton. Uh, in North America. Really? Yeah. So, yeah. What? so that's that. local, homegrown, right? Like, again, back to what Gersh was saying, a lot of this change is going to come from homegrown companies and people, individuals that are willing to to accept that and not kind of look at the past and start building the future with it. Yeah. Right? So. And, I mean, you have to take a look at the asset ratio as well. If you take a look at Canada as a whole and from a global perspective, what would you say Canada's strength is? Probably, probably oil and gas and agriculture. Yeah, I would say. I would say I, maybe, may, and maybe I'm too narrow-sighted in not Alberta. So those are. What would you? What would you say? Diversity. Yeah, diversity. Huge. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. Diversity. I was. So I'm you're, way too, <laughs> you're like, like industries. Something when whenever we look at an industry, a group of people yeah. as a whole, because you're looking at people, not products, and anytime you have to assess something that's valuable inside that ecosystem, it has to be something that's timeless. 
Agriculture has an expiry date to it. Oil and gas has an expiry date to it, but diversity doesn't. Diversity is still not fully understood. Canada, with Bill, I think it was C16, yeah. just made it um, in some capacity uh, illegal. I'm, I'm not, and I'm not a lawyer, so I'm not sure what the actual terminology <laughs> is. But to be sure. able to be able to not give somebody the respect of the gender they've chosen, that's, that, that doesn't exist anywhere else. So that just goes to show the strength of Canadians as a whole. And one of the things that we need to take into consideration touching on this realm of yeah. things is that what Kai just touched on in Edmonton with artificial intelligence. If your needs are taken care of, you have a reliable transportation system, as we do in many of our cities. You have the ability to get, into, get food, so we have uh, reasonable enough jobs even at the level service level or you have welfare and food banks mm -hmm. and all your basic needs are taken care of you shouldn't have to strive physically for your life anymore you should be able to use your mental capacity that's where the strength exists so the biggest resource through our diversity is our ability to think as Canadians as well too so you know going up um, and, and Kai mentioned it, even in Saskatchewan having a you know physically work for his dollar and break his back and go into that situation where he had to rent a $10 motel and sleep on the bed isn't something that we were interested in and I don't think many people in our age group are. That's a fundamental shift that's moving forward and people now understand that you can make money similar to you do. Like, you know, you sit in a coffee shop and you use your mind mm -hmm. and that's where the value is. So when we take a look to rewind it back to what Kai mentioned a few times without us sharing is our vision and our mission. Our vision is that there's 1.5 billion people on the earth that don't have access to basic amenities. They're living in the dark. They don't have electricity. For us, One, you would... 1.5 billion. Billion. Billion, yeah. Holy. Uh, the why that touches, rings a chord with us so much, Kai and I are born in Canada. We're both immigrants. Mm -hmm. um, I know to some people that has some value and some people it doesn't. It is quite important because you get to see the struggle that your parents go through when you move here. And you also are more connected to the world as a whole. Um, I mean, I come from a place... And my dad at least comes from a place in India where he didn't have electricity until he was a teenager and then he moved to England and then he packed it up again and moved to Canada. So he had two massive jumps in his life. So for me to just sit idle and take all the luxuries of living in Canada and not doing something is a personal issue. So that's where that comes into play. And that's what also ties into our mission. Now that we've identified that our vision is to solve these issues, so that 1.5 billion people help them transition to the, into the, all the awesome things that we have in Canada. Our mission is to enable people to live sustainably in their everyday lives, whether it be at work or home. No, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, if immigrant, I, I wasn't, I was raised, born and raised in Calgary, but you know, my dad's an immigrant, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. fast food jobs, those kind, yeah. that kind of service level jobs. Yeah, you still feel the pain in right? sense, yeah. Oh yeah, like seeing how hard he worked, like if I can work even like a 10th yeah. that hard, like. Yeah, and it's amazing to have that influence in your life. Um, and that's what does happen in larger populations when you get separated from something further and further and further and further that in some cases you forget you forget the hardships that everybody had to get go through in order to get here but that's just the advancement of technology as a whole uh, it's happening so rapidly uh, that you can't keep up with it anymore like the rate of technology advancement is greater than the conversation can keep up with oh it's insane right like yeah. you can look at like something as simple as like Amazon, for example, that like enables like anyone in their basement to, to make like 15 G's in a day yeah. from selling file folders. Mm -hmm. Right? Like I met I met this dude in Seattle over the summer, and he makes he, in sales he does about a hundred thousand dollars a day selling salt and pepper shakers. Well, wow. just because yeah. he's top rated on yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's cool though because it lets it like. Yeah, it lets your mind be your tool, right? Rather than your hands and, and beating up your body, right? It's so valuable to you. Like, everyone always talks about how valuable fitness and all these things are to you. But what, if your job is beating you up, what's the point of all these other things, right? Like, it, if, it's, if it's mentally and physically beating you up, what's the point of treating your body so nicely with food and fitness? It's kind of like that teeter-totter, right? You have to look at it in a full perspective rather than just saying, okay, like, I want to be healthy in these ways, but my job, it doesn't matter. Like, I'll go do these things and let the stress wear me out and things like that, right? So that's how really cool in our, our day and time yeah. we can actually have those jobs. I like got something that five, 10 years ago you can never even imagine. Yeah, you know, someone yeah. would laugh at you. If you told them that mm -hmm. guys get sell salt and pepper shakes on Amazon, you would just laugh at you, right? Like, yeah. It, yeah. Which is, yeah. And there's no such thing as the good old days. That never existed. If you, if you even talk to like my dad right now and said, hey, 
rewind 30 years, you have your youth back in your hands, but I'm going to take away your kids and that smartphone in your hand, he probably wouldn't want to go back in time. No, not at all. Oh, there's so many people are caught up in the good old days. Yeah. They never existed because humanity as a whole is only headed in a better direction. Mm -hmm. We have these kind of conversations going on. We have the ability to share our thoughts. Uh, we have goals of becoming sustainable. Even Amazon, like let's talk about salt and pepper shakers. Yeah. How many pieces of cardboard and plastic do you think is part of his process and is just polluting the planet? Is going into the ocean? Is creating yeah. issues? Yeah, like, I can think off the top of my yeah. head, like four. But the nice thing about that is that's driven by profit. Profit will, as far as humanity goes, dollar is the most valuable thing that we have. That's what drives everything forward as an economy. But eventually, it gets to a point where another issue is another issue has arised, you know, they have a billion dollar portfolio or if not close to a trillion, they can now take that money and put it towards that. So if a large organization is causing these issues, they can also help clean up and there's a possibility that could advance the human species even further on the sustainable side. So every time there's a bad thing happening, there's also a massive opportunity that exists as well too. And that's why Alberta is so important to the world. It's not necessarily just here. That if Alberta can figure out how to make this transition, I think it'll be one of the golden examples of how to do it correctly. That's a, that's insane because yeah, I didn't even, and I didn't even think about like what happens when, right? What happens when we you know we are no longer the energy province of Canada, right? Like, mm -hmm. Where is that? And it it takes that corporate investment as well, right? At a bigger level. So good example I just heard the other day is IKEA. So they put out a statement, okay. corporate. Idea? Yeah. So they okay. put out a statement saying we're going. All of our stores across the world have to be 100% offset by renewable energy by 2020. And they did this last year, so two years, not very much time. Um, Alberta just hit. They produce all of their projects that they have, plus the solar and all the stuff that they do in their stores, four times as much as what their usage is. So that's an Alberta story, right? That they're the ones in an, in the economy here in Alberta. They've done four times as much as what they need. That's them. The the threefold time is giving back to making the other grid uh, more renewable, right? With the investment that they put into wind farms, solar on their buildings. That whole rooftop's chargers. full of solar, by the way, yeah. and there's electric vehicle charging stations, like six units in the front one of the building. In, the one in Edmonton. Just down the hill here, yeah. The one in Edmonton was the biggest install. To, it won the award for best install in 2018. Did you guys do it? No. 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 Unfortunately, no, not. It, was a, it was a big yeah. company out of Ontario, but it's yeah. a corporate contract. Yeah. Um, but yeah, EV chargers, like, that's the thing. It's these companies that in the end need to make that impact. At, and at their level, it's it's minuscule, right? What's that money of them spending a few million dollars on these projects when how much money they're making? Amazon, right? Trillion dollar company. They they have uh, goals as well to be 100% sustainable. And even their cardboard thing, I was watching a video on that. They have ways that they want to try to mitigate that because they've had so many problems with, they have too much packaging. Uh, and that's starting to become a big topic now in 2019, 2020 is what they want to approach. How can they minimize that packaging? How can they do their part in that too, right? So it is it is all different realms um, of companies. Even, I guess to bring it back to Alberta, even uh, energy companies, Suncor just um, announced their level three charging stations in Ontario that they're piloting. That's, uh, they well, under Petrocan, but they, that's the epitome of oil and gas, right? And they're putting their research and development into level three gas, gas, EV plug stations at gas stations in Ontario. So yeah. it's, and level three, level three is pretty crazy. Like you're sorry, talking yeah. about, yeah, if you're talking, level three? Sorry, yeah. there's yeah. different, there's different <laughs> levels of electric vehicle charging. Okay. Level one would be plugging into a standard wall outlet, yeah. kind so of. Like yeah, you're yeah. you're talking like sixteen, probably like twelve to sixteen hours to charge a full vehicle. Water, yeah. uh, level two. You, really? I can yeah. charge a full vehicle off of. It's yeah, like, it'll take it's you. Like it'll, hours. It's okay, yeah. Yeah. it's long. Yeah. It's long. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah. That's possible. crazy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and then from that, you're talking about an, like a four hundred and fifty to five hundred fifty kilometer range. But the level three that Kai's talking about, um, ABB is a big company in that space right now. So are these the ones that I see? Like I see you posting on your Instagram? Yeah, of those we have a couple threes? of those. Yeah, okay. some of the ones yeah. that we work on, and that you're talking about potentially, and actually I think ABB's uh, STC values show 500 kilometers in under 10 minutes. You're talking about the same speed as a gasoline vehicle. Yeah. You go up to the charging station, plug it in, and most of these are designed around amenities, so you don't need to be there for your car. It's, most of them are app based, so it'll be like, oh, go. Like your car is 80% full, 90% full, 100% full. So you can go grab a coffee, come back and your car will so be yeah, done. Yeah, like a restaurant, like a restaurant will yeah, be really, like yeah. the yeah. next gas station. Or even like Ikea, like we just mentioned, think about that. You pull your car up, it charges. Uh, ideally it's an amenity, so you're getting free charging. So your transportation to Ikea was free, your transportation home was free. So in a sense, whatever you bought at Ikea, you got a discount. Well, 
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then for them, it's free as well because it's all solar powered. So again, it, the whole circular cycle, economy, right? Yeah, that's the, the kind of cycle's beautiful in that sense. Yeah, it's awesome. Circular economy. Do you go into that? Yeah, let's. Uh, I can give you an example. So. Yeah. Uh, Everybody berates the Chinese government for different things they do. They also do tech very nicely. Uh, they put some mandates into play in the first quarter of, actually, I think it was the second quarter of 2018. It's been a little while now. And what it was designed around was car manufacturers coming into China and selling their products. So let's use BMW, for example. BMW comes into China. China says, okay, well, listen, if you want to sell your cars here, uh, you have to follow our regulations. What their regulations were designed was around the circular economy. So after 12 years, the manufacturer is responsible for the battery. So that's a non-issue now in some cases. Those regulations will most likely make it to the States and they'll make it here as well too. So to draw the fuller picture, you live in Shenzhen or Beijing, you buy a BMW i3, you drive it for 11 years, on the 12th year the battery is not at the same capacity, BMW is responsible for taking that battery, they pull it out, they give you a new one, they take that battery and they put it into public transportation or they repackage it for uh, home energy storage. So that battery now has an extended lifespan, it ends up in somebody's house, it powers their home from the solar fed or wind or whatever it might be, and you have a new battery set, which eventually will most likely end up getting pulled out again or repurposed in some capacity. So now when manufacturers are going into processes, they're looking at the whole life cycle of it. They can't say, you know, here's a watch, these are all the components inside of it, if it dies it's fine, it's just going to end up on a shelf. They're like, no, how can we design this in a way that it can be upcycled? or it can be repurposed or something else. So that's what the whole circular economy dictates, that you shouldn't have to buy 10 different watches, you should only have to buy one. And that ideally should last you the lifespan, or there should be some sort of supporting mechanism for that to come into play, which is similar to some of the lawsuits that Apple is facing, for example, in the States right now for their anti-repair laws and whatnot, where you previously couldn't pull out a battery in an Apple device because they glued it to the phone itself. Yeah. So the device would end up breaking. So they're getting sued for that now because it's not friendly to the ecosystem as a whole. You can't get a device to last longer than like 16 to months to two years. So the world as a whole is shifting away from that. Regulations are starting to support that and governments as a whole are starting to shift mm -hmm. in the right direction and uh, it's a really bright future from our perspective. So, so kind of like getting away from the energy topic, but where do you think Alberta and even Calgary sits in the conversation when it comes to tech on a global scale? Uh, that's an interesting one. I think manufacturing is a major component to a lot of things that happens in Alberta, but it's mostly man-powered manufacturing, let's say, for example. There are a few good examples across the board. I mean, the Amazon facility is being developed in, uh, I think it's in the Northeast. It's, okay. yeah, it's done. Is it by uh, Bal like, it's Balzac, by yeah. right. it's huge. And in some capacity, that one's going to have a high level of machine learning and basic automation built into it. You um, guys should take a look at the company Atabotics. Atabotics, yeah, yeah I'll have to check it out. Huh. Yeah, And um, I'm sure they do something similar along those lines. Where, where that comes into play is in two, in two places that I find are fundamental when I'm looking at technologies on home where it's critically needed next. Smartphones are where they are. They're, they're going to keep on getting smarter. That doesn't necessarily need any more of a push. It's about getting people out of jobs that is sacrificing their bodies, is causing them to have shorter lifespans, is affecting their health and shifting, shifting them in the right direction. So automation is quite important in that area. And so is artificial intelligence in some capacity. If, um, let's say for example, uh, you know, you want to be able to maximize your time with your family. Different things can waste your time. Buying groceries can waste your time. Um, having to fuel your vehicle can waste your time. Any of these number of things can waste your time. If artificial intelligence comes into play where it understands your habits, knows what you want to buy from the grocery store, knows that you now have an electric vehicle and it can charge it during the night, you negotiate all that time back in your favor. So rather than having, you know, always having to be on the limit and feeling stressed and not necessarily having time in your control, all this technology is going to give you, that, give you that back and it talks on the same level in some capacity to the automation tying into that innovation and artificial intelligence that there will be less errors, there will be less incidents, there will be less people getting hurt, um, people will possibly be able to do what they want to do instead. There's really good examples in UK companies that have implemented some sorting automation in their, their warehouse facilities for grocery stores in which a lot of the people that work there, did, they were able to retain their jobs and they were happy because they said the task that that automation is now doing was things they didn't want to do anyways and they were really laborious and was breaking down their bodies. So as a whole, to tie back into your question where it comes into place in Alberta, um, long haul trucking, 
for example. Yeah. A lot of accidents happen. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of social issues tied to that as well too. Families are broken apart. Fathers aren't home for their children. That, there's a good potential that Tesla as an organization, Rivian, any of these companies that have uh, machine learning designed into their vehicles that are constantly picking up all these different data metrics as they drive around are going to be able to give those people their lives back. So that's where that could be a big advantage in Alberta. Um, Fork related in, forklift related injuries at work, that could go by the wayside too. Yeah. So there's a lot of back end benefits that aren't necessarily spoken about because all it comes back to is, oh, I'm going to lose my job. And it's like, no, you're not going to lose your job. You're going to lose that task. So thank you for checking out that interview. Um, I hope you guys were able to get some value from that. I know I was. Um, and if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Um, your attention means everything to us. And if you are a small business owner or an entrepreneur doing something very cool in this city, reach out. Would love to sit down and have a conversation and see and tell your story. So uh, reach out to me personally at alan.lu at suresystems.ca and uh, chat with you on the other side.